Hello and welcome to Audiovisual Cultures, a podcast that explores different areas of the arts and cultural production. I'm Paula Blair and in this one I thought it would be useful to revisit films that demonstrate ways that disabilities come into their own when sudden changes brought about by a widespread invasion of something not unlike a pandemic as we're experiencing at the time of recording this intro are widely disabling and the usually non-disabled must learn a new way of living to survive. Back in January 2019, Andrew Sheil and I were recorded a general discussion about watching films and programmes and Netflix with his family during the 2018 winter holidays. As part of that we spent some time on Bird Box directed by Suzanne Beer and adapted by Eric Hauser from the 2014 novel by Josh Mallerman and starring Sandra Bullock. For this episode, I've extracted that part of the chat to highlight the importance of including people of all abilities and vulnerabilities, not just at times of crisis, but always. We all matter, and I hope this story finds new appreciation in the light of challenging times. A good pairing for this is episode 15 on A Quiet Place, the sequel for which has been postponed for release later in the year. Huge thanks to members on patreon.com forward slash avcultures for all your support. Everyone is welcome to get involved in the chat on our socials or by sending in recordings or even doing a live chat with me. Listen to the end for contact details. For now, enjoy this rerun. So we went, oh, if you insist, so we watched Bird Box. This film seems like it was made because A Quiet Place was successful. It's seldom that simple, of course, particularly given that Bird Box is based on a novel, a novel that was published well before A Quiet Place was made. So it's based on a 2014 novel called Bird Box by Um, Josh Malaman. Given the proximity of them coming out, the production would be well underway, probably. Yeah, it seems like a bit of a coincidence. It's not the site equivalent of Mm -hmm. A Quiet Place, because if it was, it would be that if you're seen by the aliens, then you die. Mm -hmm. But it's that if you see see the aliens, then you die. You never really find out what it is. I mean, it's never clear that it's an alien invasion. People are dying so fast that you don't really know what it is it could be it's just some sort of supernatural creature or some sort of supernatural event and it actually (laughs) seems to be quite individual to every victim because there are people who hear their own loved ones so the premise is that people see something that's so deeply horrific and so saddening to them, so desperately, desperately saddening that they instantly feel the need to end their lives and they'll find the closest means of doing so. And that they'll do it with a blissed out look on the face as well. So yeah. there's this little change from what you would expect somebody who's in the depths of despair to do, which is to cry uncontrollably mm. and become this emotional wreck. They do it as if they're in a state of ecstasy. They believe that it's the best thing to yeah. do. They're affected psychologically by mm. whatever these things are. I love that the film doesn't show them to us yeah it's we, always implied yeah. at the end of a quiet yeah. place we get to see what these aliens look like mm. in quite some detail mm. and why it is that they're um so sensitive to sound because their ears are most of their heads but in this the closest we get to seeing these and i'm going to call them aliens because i reckon it's rather than supernatural but it's just extraterrestrial is that we get one character who has been permitted to see them and to live so they seem to have this choice to affect people in such a way that they don't kill themselves but he's been in chanted in some way to i'm using supernatural language he's been induced in some way to make other people look at them he considers them to be utterly beautiful and so he's done all these drawings of them yes and at one point he gets out his drawings and takes out a fresh piece of paper and Mm. starts doing more drawings Mm -hmm. and those drawings as he lays them out on the table they're drawings of monsters they're quite horrific but that's the closest we get in this film to seeing what these things look like which i think was great because Mm. what they look like not only does it not really matter but it makes it scarier if we're constantly imagining what these things that are just off screen Poor look like. old Tom Hollander. Love He's a bit. always playing awful person. Well, we, we mentioned <laughs> his awesomeness in discussing Bohemian Rhapsody. That's true. He's pretty yeah. great in that. He's okay in that, but he's still quite a sinister he's character. Not, and he plays it so well. This yeah. guy who's almost possessed by these things. 
you know, and he goes on this quite murderous rampage trying to get other people to look at them. And when he can't do that, just killing them and saying, I'm sorry, you don't get to see how beautiful it is. It's really disturbing. That's how John Malkovich's character buys it. Yeah. He just gets yeah, stabbed. A bit more John Malkovich again. Can you look up the director, Suzanne Beer? Just on this idea of not being able to see the creatures. If you're an up and coming filmmaker, and Netflix has really been supporting <coughs> women filmmakers who've been struggling to get funding, Mudbound, which we still haven't seen, mm -hmm. but it's in our list. D Rays, it's really got her on the map. They're supporting, she's got a really stellar cast in that. This production is starring and executive produced by Sandra Bullock. And I think just the idea of not seeing the monsters. A lot of filmmakers have cut their teeth on doing horrors where they've had to be inventive mm -hmm. about subjective camera work and implying things in the off-screen space, implying what their monsters are so that they don't actually have to go to the expense of trying to design and then have on screen a monster. And then the potential of that looking really rubbish is it Gareth Edwards who his first feature was Monsters which he made on his laptop in his bedroom because mm -hmm. it's all through sound design you never actually see the monsters in the title and then he went on to direct the Godzilla remake and Star Wars and things it's not just cheap it's smart isn't it to yeah, it's have a, monsters it's that you barely see it's an way of doing it it's a creative solution to a really big set of problems is you know mm. your budget constraints what equipment, what props you can use. A lot of the times the creature is implied through very strong wind lifting up lots of leaves, blowing at the camera. So that's something you can create in part for real with a blower and some leaves. But I think a lot of the time it's done digitally. I think because it's such a simple concept, it works really well because you can really have trees. You can be pulling trees back to make them look like they're being blown. You can have a wind machine on them to make them look like being blown. So you can create those effects and it's through the timing, it's through the editing. That's really where the <laughs> scares come. There's never any jump scares, I don't think. I can't remember any real jump scares. Like, no. You're almost waiting for them. But it's similar to A Quiet Place in that it's highly suspenseful. Because of being conditioned by A Quiet Place, there were times when I was trying not to react <laughs> verbally. Yeah. Noise yeah. isn't actually an issue. If, I mean, you're trying not to draw attention to yeah. yourself, of course, but this thing can see you yeah. and it is aware of when human... It only seems to affect humans because birds are really important. A bird box, of course, is yeah. the crux of the thing. We've touched upon the two strengths of this film. So the first is it has a simple premise that simply says the characters you survive of the initial apocalypse do so because they've learned or do so in part just by chance but they continue to survive because they learn that the world now has an exceptional characteristic which is that you must not look outside the house if you're inside a house you can do looking mm -hmm. but if you're outside the house you can't look and that means you have to cover up all the windows as well mm -hmm. so it's an if you look at the outside world you die film and so it's all played out with that different characteristic to the world now mm -hmm. and this is all you need to do to create really great tense human drama mm -hmm. it's just go okay this one fact about life has now changed so no one can use verbs mm. you know that just a really simple thing just change that throw a bunch of humans into that mix and you've got some great drama how people deal with different situations produces great drama mm. and the second strength of this film i think is that it does leave it until quite late but it points out that in a situation in which suddenly the environment has changed and being able to see is a liability people who are blind mm. have quite a serious survival advantage over people who are sighted mm -hmm. and so this is much like in A Quiet Place because in A Quiet Place the advantage that the family mm -hmm. has is that they're very good at communicating without talking because one of their daughters is already deaf and mm -hmm. therefore they all use sign language. Mm -hmm. In Bird Box the sanctuary that Sandra Bullock's character is Mallory isn't it? Yeah. Quite a non-gen sex specific name. The sanctuary that she and her two kids find at the end is one which is a home for the blind because blind people are just automatically immune to this invasion. Meaning that if you want to survive, you need the help of the blind. It's one of these films that's just quietly aware of how specific to circumstances are our abilities. It changes the environment a little bit and we are just awfully evolved creatures. We're only kind of adequately evolved with the circumstances that we do live in anyway, yeah. but change them a bit and we're awful. This does bring me to the two bits of fiction that I'm aware of that are forerunners for this very simple story principle of mm -hmm. no one can see. So of course I realise that this is all based on a 2014 novel, so 
we're going back to forerunners for the novel. These are pieces of short fiction from 1908 and from 1920. They're very, very similar short stories, and I'm sure that these aren't the only two pieces of fiction where this thing happens. So 1908, it's called The Fog, and it's by Morley Roberts. And 1920, it's called The Black Grip, grips about G-R-I-P-P-E, written by Edgar Wallace. And in both of these stories, something happens that means that suddenly no one can see. Mm. And both these stories are set in London. Mm. None of the characters know anything about the rest of England, mm. let alone the rest of the world. In London, at least, suddenly no one can see. And that means that people who've been blind since birth and are used to navigating without being able to see suddenly become heroes. And in the first one, it's this guy called Crab. They just call him Blind Crab or Old Crab. He's this guy who's been blind since birth. And he becomes a hero hero to this group of characters who are unable to see because the fog in London is so thick. And in the 1921 by Edgar Wallace, the heroes are people who are members of institutes for the blind, because in the 1921, the reason why everyone gets blinded is because of a disease. And it's a disease that blinds you for about 10 days, and then you get your sight back. And so what the government does is it, it actually knows this is going to happen, because some scientists have done some experiments on rabbits and go, this is about to happen to all humans. They let the government know, and the government just contacts all these institutes for the blind, and the blind are used to set up this rude elementary communications network that just about lets the government continue to function. And so the blind being heroes because something prevents all the people who are used to seeing from seeing is exactly what happens in this film and also presumably in the novel too. The blind people being heroes, it's left until the end and I really kept expecting a blind character to turn up and go, guys, it's okay, I can help you because they can't affect me and I'm completely used to travelling without being able to see. Watching these sighted characters mm. trying to get around without being able to see that was one of the really tense parts yeah. and the fact that, that at one point Tom who's I've just realized is introduced very early very early yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, even before we mm -hmm. get to learn what his name is he says let's just take the car it's got motion sensors front and back so we'll be able to tell if we're gonna hit something and we'll just go around mm -hmm. someone said to me get in this car and black out the windows and then go and drive it mm -hmm. it's fine just trust the motion sensors I'd be a nervous wreck mm -hmm. But they do it anyway. And they manage to get to the local supermarket. And the motion sensors can even pick up the aliens. Mm. And they, they seem to kind of... They seem to fly. Whenever people... I just noticed this. Whenever people are looking yeah, up, looking yeah. at the they aliens, seem to, they seem to look up. And that fits with the principle of the leaves lifting off the ground. Like they suck leaves at mm. them. And that they disrupt the foliage seemingly from above. I suppose let's also acknowledge at this point that this is one of those films which it doesn't have anything in it which cannot possibly be real in that you know, when we see a car explode you can do an exploding car when you're doing principal photography. In that sense it's got things which you could just produce as a visual effect without doing it in post-production, without doing the effects in post-production, but it became quite clear after a while that a lot of this film was constructed in post-production. So we just saw a car exploding. There was something a little bit wrong about that explosion, mm. wasn't there? It was quite clean. I think they had a car that was on fire and they just added the explosion in post-production. So there's loads of that. When they're going down the river, quite a lot of those shots seem to be stitched together digitally. The stuff with the eyes, of course, that's all done digitally. Everyone's eyes change colour when they see one of these aliens. It was a tense film, and I didn't frequently find myself going, how much time is left? That's one of the temptations with Netflix, because you've got a slider along the bottom Well, I that think you've got you. a habit of doing that when you're watching things on your laptop, but we didn't watch this on your laptop. It was on no. a television screen. And if you pause it on TV, it will tell you how much time is left, but that would have made everyone Yeah, but you can't just slug me. run your finger over a mouse pad to yeah. check, because you have a really annoying habit of doing that. <laughs> I do, yeah. It's I really do. disruptive. <laughs> <laughs> Acting from Sandra Bullock? She's really great in it. I'm just with mm. her. Her character's interesting because she's an artist. It's set up early on that she's heavily pregnant. She's not really interested in the baby or who the father is or any of that. She's not really interested in relationships. She's in quite a bit of denial about the fetus growing inside her. Hollywood has an amazing ability never to tackle the issue of abortion. Non-mainstream films, yeah, absolutely. They go at it head-on, but Hollywood goes, no, not going to do this. Netflix, does that count as Hollywood? Is it well, I outside think... the mainstream? Yeah. It seems that, at least in its attitude towards abortion, it's completely in the mainstream, because Mallory's attitude to being pregnant is one of, I'll just ignore it. It seems to say what a character would reasonably do if they're pregnant and they don't want to be pregnant is just ignore it, which... It seems like a desperate way of trying to go, let's have a character giving birth against her will, but have to um, create a justification for it 
Because, of course, somebody could have an abortion in this country before 20-ish weeks for in order for her to be pregnant and have to carry a baby to term against her will. Rather than us making it so that she's just come from a country where you can't have an abortion, say, or that she lives in a state where she's been systemically prevented from having one or prevented by her family from having one, they just make it that she's just a bit kooky. She's kooky enough to just ignore the fact that she's pregnant right up until a month or so before she's due. It just seems like this character would have had an abortion. That seems like the much more realistic thing yeah. in the backstory here. Well, there's probably quite a few things that, I mean, just to put it out there, that's probably where a film like Dirty Dancing is actually really quite punk and out there for yeah. actually dealing with something like that directly. I got the impression that it's an act that she's putting on. Right. You know, like it's because this is somebody who's a survivor. That could be a way, though, of just excusing it because you could be right that yes, this is just mainstream media production in a very general sense, mm. just not acknowledging yeah. abortion in the US. But I mean, also it depends what state you're in, things are changing and currently the US has an administration that does want to scale right back on abortion laws. This is the thing I hadn't considered. It might be that this is a character who could just come out at one point in the film and say, no, I, I'm pro-life, I don't believe that having an abortion yeah, it, is right. Could, she could just say that. It could well but be, of course, yeah. what that suggests is they don't want to touch the issue with a barge pole. They don't want to yeah, make the just, character stand anywhere on abortion. This film I thought was quite impressive in terms of its character because even with people you, you don't really spend a lot of time with you get yeah. a sense of the person yeah. quite easily I think Mallory puts on a, a bit of an act of being a cold hard-nosed person but it's just when she meets Olivia who mm. is also heavily pregnant when she comes into it because they take refuge in a house and another pregnant woman manages to find them and come in she's very sweet and she's had a very sheltered life it's all Disney princesses and she's really mm -hmm. hoping she has a little girl so that she can call her Jasmine or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mallory at first is quite she's never rude to her but she is quite distant. Olivia tries to be friends and they're going through a very similar experience together. This very intense unique experience that they're both having that they're heavily pregnant in the middle of this catastrophe. But Mallory does soften. She does start to understand her. She sees her as a human being. Even the John Malkovich character character who Mallory tells him to his face that she thinks he's an asshole. He puts his own life over others. He takes quite a while for him to come good and it gets to a point actually where the rest of them don't trust him enough and that he actually can't come good properly. In a way he scuppers himself quite a bit. It's set up in a way that he's the foil because her interactions with him actually show that she does care about people and she does care about the baby that she's carrying. Not only that she cares about the other other people, all of them, she wants them all to survive. She wants Olivia and her baby to survive. And when Olivia becomes affected because Tom Hollander goes crazy go nuts and opens out all the windows and is trying to get everybody to look, Olivia accidentally looks out the window and she can't help but see what it is. And she's yeah. holding her baby and Mallory is desperately trying to, you know, they've both gone into labour at the same time. <laughs> Not on the same day, but on the, in the same the same minute. moment, yeah. yeah. It's revealed when they meet that their due date is a day apart. So they both go into labour at the same time. They're both birthing at the same time. There's this room that is just taken over with birthing. And it's happening in the middle of this intense situation that's happening. Because at the same time, you know, the Tom Hollander character, he takes the opportunity to show his hand, as it were, because he manages to convince them that he's a normal when he's not. To get into the house, that's where my Mallory really expresses how caring she is and the fact that it's intercut, it's going back and forth in time where it actually begins with her and the two children, a boy and a girl of the same age and it goes back six years so you know that these kids are five years old. It gives it good momentum. It's becoming quite a common practice these days yeah. to go, we're going to start in media res, yeah. then we'll go back and tell you where this all comes from we'll catch um, up. and we'll catch up and then we'll but, tell but, you the rest. Yeah, but it keeps reminding us of the in media res action is still going on as we're moving up to the present so it keeps it nice and tense you asked me about Suzanne Beer, Beer. Danish made a lot of films in Denmark 
Seems really Very familiar. successful. Well, she was one of the Dogma 95 manifesto directors. Oh, right. That's self-constructed box of limitations. Mm. And you probably know her from The Night Manager. She was director of The Night Manager TV series starring Tom Hiddleston, Hugh Laurie, Olivia Colman, David Harewood, Tom Hollander, and Elizabeth Debicki. Well, I never saw that, but that makes sense that she's on TV before. What are her Danish films, though? Because I know her name from something. Oh, blimey. Quite some few. Of course, we're talking English titles. Freud's Leaving Home, 1991. Mm. Family Matters, 1994. Like It Never Was Before, 1995. Credo, 97. The One and Only, 99. Once in a Lifetime, 2000. Brothers, 2004. Maybe that. After the Wedding, 2006. Things We Lost in the Fire, 2007. In a Better World, 2010. Maybe that one. Love is All You Need, 2012. Serena, 2014. The scene in which one of the characters says, hey, let's use the CCTV cameras on the outside of my house. Oh, per B.D. Wong. Yeah, to... He's from Jurassic Park, isn't he? Yes, of course. His character in this is called Greg. It was nice that they just refer to his husband and it's not a big deal. Yeah, everyone's lost someone. That seems to be yeah, the thing. Where everybody. The, the, when they arrive mm. in this house, there's about ten of them. And John Markovich's character, who is Douglas, we see him lose his wife yeah. as... She's trying to help. As Mallory, Mallory. arrives. Mm-hmm. Yeah, everyone has a story about how they've just lost someone. It is one of those horror... Do we call this a horror film? It's, it's good it's, horror inflections. It's like mm. a quiet place. It's very difficult to pin a genre on it because it's a suspense horror thriller. Oh, we were talking about B.D. Wong's character, Greg, using the security cameras. Mm. I was thinking, oh, right, yeah, it's mechanical seeing. Mm. It's just digital information. Surely they can't get you via digital cameras, but they can. Yeah, he was thinking it would mediate, but it doesn't mediate it enough. And clearly when they use the motion sensors on the car, that means mediates it enough so yeah, it just seems to be it's not di- vision not directly seeing it it's just sensing it yeah this is quite terrifying yeah. we're watching that bit where Greg sees the CCTV footage and it's just moving shadows okay yeah so genre thriller I think would be my see, genre of thriller, choice thriller you associate with crime you know mm. you think there's a caper effect and that mm. there's working out to be done but this is it's working out how to survive in a world where you it's not safe for you to see anything well maybe that's a subgenre we could appoint is a survival survivalist drama. Because again, it's got those inflections of post-apocalypse. Well, it's the apocalypse happening because the human race is being systematically wiped out unless you can get to these kinds of sanctuaries that are Mm. schools for the blind. But yeah, it is really interesting how it doesn't even seem to be a consideration. But then the quiet place centres around that family that has a deaf child. And so they're all fluent in sign language. But and this doesn't even occur to people that, oh, we should see how blind people cope. Because I think in a way that's more realistic in terms of how society just thinks because we normalise the default kind of human that has yeah. all the limbs and everything working. The able-bodied are privileged and so when you're not able-bodied and suddenly you're capable of surviving better than the able-bodied, it changes what able-bodied means. The thing that this definitely has in common with The Quiet Place is it proposes that we have unwisely normalised normalised a certain yeah. body type. The problem though with The Quiet Place is that the deaf character causes quite a bit of danger because she doesn't understand sound. Yes. That's yeah. the problem because she gives her little brother the toy that kills him. Her not understanding Because she doesn't understand sense. how loud yeah. it's going to be and that he's really not going to use it properly because he's five. He's not going to yeah. do what he's told. She can't hear the noise that she makes. That's the thing. Yeah. She's a loud character. It's just it's enabled the others to be quiet, to live in a silent world, and to understand mm. what it's like to live in a silent world. But she can <clears throat> make noise. It's the problem. She can't hear the noise that she's able to make. Whereas in this, it's different because you don't have an equivalent there with the blind. Yeah, the blind are not a liability for the sighted. Yeah. Actually, yeah, this is a kind of step onwards from a quiet uh-huh. place because it has this bit at the end where basically the blind are the people leading the yeah. sight. They're the new society, yeah. but what kind of a society is it? Because that's the whole point of the bird box, is that they find that it's birds. They find these budgies in the shop, because budgies are in shops and cages, you know, in supermarkets. It's in a supermarket, yes. um, Because <laughs> that's naturally where they would be. <laughs> so there's these three budgies that they manage to keep alive. The birds can sense when the creature is nearby, and they yeah. go nuts, they just 
squawk and squawk and squawk, that is a warning signal, it's an alarm. And I suppose that's one of the things that distinguishes this quite sharply from A Quiet Place, because in A Quiet Place there's a, these things have a weakness narrative, and finding out what that is means they can start to fight back it just yeah. before the film ends. Whereas in this, it's, you just need to do a bit of observing to find out simply how to sense the creatures yeah. without seeing them. Yeah. The piece of very important information that you need is not a piece of information about how to hurt the creatures, it's just a piece of information about how to know when to close them? your eyes. Yeah, how do you evade them? And that's the problem is that you can't trust everybody around you either. And even the creature seems to develop. It's doing something with the emotions when it's trying to seduce people into looking. It's trying to get the children to take their blindfolds off. It's trying to trick people. It uses the voices, which is in a way where you do actually need to be quiet in this world, is it uses the voices that would be trusted mm -hmm. to take the blindfolds off so that they will see and that it can take their lives whatever it's using them for because in the mm. quiet place it seems to be a manner of feeding yeah. but here there's no explanation there's just don't know what these things are this is just this phenomenon that happens nobody can even study it because there's just no way to mm. yet it's just about survival at this point the fact that these aliens they don't just have this automatic hunting instinct which is just if they think about a human killing themselves or in fact even not even if they think it if they just are seen by a human they automatically make a human mm. want to kill themselves they can manipulate it to mm. an extent they can go alright so that human there I don't want that human to feel the despair that means that they kill themselves I want that human to have the opposite reaction it seems is... to be that they figure out that people will start wearing blindfolds they need to find a way of getting them to take their blindfolds off and the way to mm. do it is to because at first people are trusting people because if you're not killing yourself you see seem to be normal so nobody mm. knows yet what signs to look out for. I think you said when we were watching the film the first time that it's a way of wiping out the planet to take over the planet possibly. Yeah. Could be a reason why it's happening yeah. beyond the speculation you really just don't know. A guy who's been mind controlled by them says it shall cleanse the world. Mm. The idea is that humans are being... Yeah, they? it's like an extinction event. And there's this equivalent lifeboat, another kind of bird box left yeah. at the end. This sanctuary where they've managed it. It's this school that's in the mountains somewhere. Or no, it's in a river valley somewhere. Yeah, it's near an estuary. It's very mm -hmm. vague where this even is. It's really, yeah. really vague. Their voice on the radio says, listen for the bird song, follow the bird song. So they've got their little budgies in this little box that they're carrying because that's their water warning sign mm. when they finally do get there they manage to have daylight because they've got this incredible topiary would you call it it's not yeah. so it is like a cage it is a sort of gilded cage thing isn't it where they're trapped inside they've got everything they need it's quite a small community but if more people manage to find it it's going to fill up <laughs> um, that, that did occur to me actually yeah so i suppose the building's quite big it's got this central courtyard growing over that central uh -huh. courtyard is trees and bushes that have grown up the building yeah. over both sides and knitted together yeah. over the top so that light can still come in it's still mm -hmm. quite light but they can't see anything mm -hmm. through this really thick matted mass of trees mm -hmm. I mean clearly whatever these beings are they can't just pull a few branches aside mm -hmm. they seem to have a rather abstract existence I thought maybe it was we need to say it again maybe but I thought there was a structure there that right. they were actually growing across so that you couldn't just go through the foliage yeah there is a structure as if the place already is an aviary. Yeah. We've got to point out the rather brutal characteristic of this film, which is that Mallory lets these two kids get to age five without five, giving six, them names. Yeah. Well, he calls them girl and boy. The girl and boy, and they don't know any different. Tom has been with them for most of the six years yeah. since she's met him. If we're being literal and it's six years later, they're probably just coming six. So they're about six. Tom and Mallory and the two babies are the only survivors in the little community that they built in the house yeah. they form a family unit it's a survival unit but they do also form a family and it shows <clears> you throughout that Tom and Mallory form a relationship they have a romantic relationship it shows the softer side when she goes for supply runs in houses and again that's very similar to a quiet place where they find a system for getting around so in a quiet place it was the sand everywhere so they could walk barefoot yeah. in this they have retractable lines 
that they can use to feel their way mm -hmm. blindfolded so they go on these supply runs to abandoned houses and things she manages to find a negligee you know so you'd see that she is a sexual person she does care she is in this loving relationship with Tom mm. she is fiercely protective of these children probably a bit too much because there's a bit where it seems a bit heartless Tom is trying to tell them stories that would give them hope and the impression of a normal childhood and she's arguing with him you shouldn't get their hopes up like that they're never going to have that and this in a way it's back to being a family drama oh. this is the crux of parenting isn't it is not quite agreeing on the best way of bringing up the children just that transferred into really extreme circumstances she's so concerned for their survival she doesn't want them thinking like that and it's the crux of this film that she has to <clears throat> admit that she's wrong yeah Tom is just right he's caring and he's right he's dad from the word go mm -hmm. even when she doesn't quite realise mm -hmm. that he's the most amazing person his big thing is no these kids need to dream hers is no you're getting their hopes up they're never going to have normal mm -hmm. lives and she has to learn that she's wrong even after he's died mm -hmm. to save their lives when they get to this sanctuary at the yeah. end they can in this particular environment yeah they can have a bit more of like a normal life yeah they can integrate they can meet other kids finally what with that thing at the end? It's a bit of a random moment where... Yeah, the doctor. Dr. Lapham, who was doing a an ultrasound at the beginning. Yeah. So a sonographer. And who was the spectator at early Mallory's rather odd refusal to even admit that she yeah, was pregnant. giving her documentation about adopting. They meet her again at this uh -huh. facility. You know, having a doctor there, clearly a very useful person. But I found myself going, how did she yeah. get there? Because yeah. she was in the same hospital, out yeah, of which Mallory everyone. and her sister were driving. Uh -huh. when the first when attack happened and mm -hmm. everyone's killing themselves how did she survive? Is survival that random? I suppose we're just expected but to yeah, assume that. It's just a nice moment. It's mostly <clears throat> so that Mallory can have that conversation where she actually finally names the children. <laughs> yeah. She has to have someone to talk to. Yeah. And it's always nice to see Perminda Nagra as well. I had a very soft spot <clears throat> for a lot of people who've been in ER. I must admit to having more than a soft spot for her. She's really gorgeous So <laughs> And we haven't seen her for a long time in mm. anything, so it was really lovely to see here in this yeah. her character really just comes back so that Mallory has somebody who recognises her and knows her of old they encounter each other having survived terrible things she asks who are the children and they themselves say I'm boy I'm girl yeah. and Mallory says well actually your name is Tom and your name is Olympia well and doesn't actually tell her mm -hmm. after your mother but it's yeah it's, it's implied it's, given the conversation we that know had. Yeah, yeah we know that it's implied <clears throat> and at no point does the doctor go did you have twins <laughs> <laughs> I remember or, seeing what on the sonogram. Yeah, but you'd think six years and all of the trauma they've been through, how would you remember? But you never mm. know, maybe they would. If your life has been so small and concentrated. The soundtrack, I think, is worth talking about because it's Trent Reznor and Atticus something. So there's a bit of a Nine Inch Nails flavour to the Atticus Ross. soundtrack. Yeah, it's quite brutal. They scored The Social Network back in 2010. Why? And The Girl with Dragon Tattoo as well, 2013. So Ross is now just a member of Nine Inch Nails. And Ross is British. Yeah, it was great sound design yeah. all around. The fact that when the creatures are near, mm -hmm. their presence is not just indicated by... Is it Travant Rhodes? Travante Rhodes? How do you pronounce his first name? Because he know. is best known from Moonlight. So whenever these creatures, whatever they are, whenever mm -hmm. they're around, of course, their presence is indicated visually by shadows, leaves floating upwards, and the wind blowing. But we need something auditory as well, mm -hmm. and their presence is represented by them whispering. It's lots of voices. Like they're reaching yeah. out psychically to people. People are hearing the voices of the mother because that's the thing with John Malkovich's characters, Douglas's wife, isn't it? Yeah. Is it her mother she keeps hearing when she sees the thing? And it's as if her mother's calling her to the other side to come and be with her. And mm. that happens to Mallory. She hears Tom's voice. The children hear Mallory's voice. It tries to trick the children. Mm -hmm. It's such a sinister moment. It tries to trick the children when they've all lost each other. You know, obviously they can't see and they're trying to run through a forest. Forest. she's had a really bad fall and they all get separated it's divide and conquer the creatures try to get the children to take their blindfolds off by using mm. Mallory's voice saying it's saying okay it's to take okay, your you can take your blindfolds off and, and at that point we were going no 
just never take them off, no. ever. No matter how much you want to, no matter so, how much we would want to in that situation. She comes she to just, and she yeah. twigs and she's yelling then, no, this is my voice, don't take them mm. off. And they find each other and the boy says that the girl's scared of her because there's just the memories of her telling them off quite firmly before. And she has to express how much she loves them. She does, she really does. And I mean, it's evident she's kept them alive for six years. Yeah. And they strenuous circumstances from the parenting they've had from mm. Maori these kids are going to grow up with the most horrendous psychological scars just from the journeys alone that they've had to take to get around these journeys have been undertaken with Mallory shouting at them the mm. entire time about what they must and She's must not do been training and drilling them this is yeah. a world of terror it shows you scenes of she's in a garden with them they're tapping stones together because she's teaching them about how sound reverberates basically using sonar sonic mm. reverberation for them to learn how close they are to an object do you remember when we watched the book of Eli apparently there was clue after clue after clue in that that the main character is blind mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and uses echolocation yeah, to yeah. make his way around he makes clicking noises mm-hmm, with his tongue to mm-hmm. do echolocation I missed that completely until it was revealed near the end their life as kids is they just lose their childhood mm-hmm. that's one of those things that is going to get the average viewer to really want specifically Mallory to survive because there's other characters in the film where they're quite crappy to each other and so for them to get aliened to get suicided it's a mm-hmm. bad thing but it's not as bad as it would be for characters like Mallory. But with Mallory and two kids, the impetus in the average viewer's mind to wish them along to wherever it is they're going on this river journey is really strong. It's not just something will kill these kids, it's that something will get these kids to experience a psychological condition which kids should never experience. Mm. If there's one thing which is quite clearly an encoded reference to paedophilia, that's probably a good candidate, isn't it? Is getting the story principle of aliens that get even kids to experience the wish to kill themselves. So it's powerful stuff for just how willing it is to go to dark places. And that's why the light place at the end is so very good to get to. I was just thinking as well with the doctor. She's safe in the sonogram room Mm. at the hospital. But also, if you think about it, it's a way of seeing the sound. It was all prefigured, wasn't it? So it it makes sense then that she returns at the end because she's someone who's an expert in seeing the sound. So whatever way in which she managed to survive, Mm. maybe through luck, she was symbolically endowed with the Mm -hmm. power to get by without it. You've been listening to Audiovisual Cultures with me, Paula Blair and Andrew Scheel. The music is Common Ground by Airtone, licensed under a Creative Commons non-commercial 3.0 attribution and can be downloaded from ccmixter.org. If you're able to help cover costs, please donate via liberapay.com forward slash PEA Blair or paypal.me forward slash PEA Blair. I can't manage to pay for hosting just now, so only the latest episodes will appear on listening apps. However, the full back catalogue is in a playlist on my YouTube channel if you search for PEA Blair or find links on audiovisualcultures.wordpress.com. We're AV Cultures Pod on Instagram and AV Cultures on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks so much for listening. Be excellent to each other. Take care. <laughs>